enclosures and the Industrial Revolution and focusing on the ordinary life of ordinary people. Basically, that's what I'd like to do this week. Last time, last week, we were talking about how Britain was becoming more important on the world stage. Uh, we start with 1492, we move on to 1660, 1754, the middle of our period, the 18th century. By the end of the 18th century, it's got quite a bit bigger again, that's 1822, and uh, it's going to keep on growing through the 19th century. Uh, by 1885, it's got that much bigger again. It doesn't reach its um, height until the early uh, 20th century, which is when it's at its biggest. Around about 1920 would be about when it was at its biggest. There it is in 1919. Covers half of Africa, Australia, India, and several surrounding countries around India. And then it starts to get smaller again. Even before World War II, it's shrunk quite a bit. Uh, by 1945, uh, although the land is still there, Britain is fatally weak. It spent so much money on the Second World War. It's, it, it's still paying America back until just a few years ago for money that it borrowed in order to fight that war. So uh, Britain was fatally weak after World War II, and it lost its empire. And things have more or less gone back to the way they were in 1492, just being a small island with not very much importance in the world even if they sometimes still think they have importance. Okay? Uh, I think the British still have difficulty accepting that they don't have that empire anymore, that they're not really uh, important in the world in the way that they were. But um, what we're looking at is the period when all of that is happening, when it's expanding and growing. And we talked about the 18th century in relation to that last week. So now I'd like to move on and look at life at home. Life for ordinary people. Okay, you can see a typical sort of lower, lower class uh, pub scene here. What sort of lives did they have? One thing you might notice in the picture is there's a fair amount of racial mixing. A little uh, black kid sitting on a some Ojisang's knee there while he smokes his cigar and a uh, black lady bringing the drinks and, uh, and, and another one dancing and so on. Um, Britain has been fairly multicultural for a, fa a fairly long time in that respect. And if you remember, the slave trade was basically selling them off, selling black people off into the Americas. The ones who were in Britain uh, very often arrived as servants, um, so they would be in a lower social class position, but there was, they, weren't, they wouldn't be slaves inside Britain itself. It was in America that the slave trade itself was happening. So, so it wouldn't be unusual to see them in a pub, you know, or, um, dancing or serving drinks or something like that. That would be uh, quite typical even in Victorian times. Uh, and, and, and going back to even into the 18th century, they mostly came in in a lower class situation, but not as uh, slaves in the way that they did in America and the Caribbean. Um, we talked a little bit last week about some of the ordinary people, those poor people who were unlucky enough to be forced into the Navy or sometimes the Army uh, by press gangs, but that's just one small aspect of life at that time. It's The more you look at the 18th century, the, the more you think, how horrible this was, how terrible it was for people to live in those days, unless they were rich. If they were rich, uh, the rules would be pretty different. But for ordinary people, it was a time of unjustness and exploitation. There's not much good to say, to be honest, uh, about the 18th century, except that uh, in the end, various charities and the idea of helping the poor, uh, those ideas did catch on to a certain extent. Quite often when we think about the 18th century, we think about the elegance. All right, the sort of 
the, the world that Jane Austen describes, the world that we, we get in those early novels, uh, middle class people or upper middle class people or upper class people, people from the higher levels of society, enjoying a rather elegant life. Uh, the very rich didn't even work. I mean, work was just, it was for the poor. Okay, the rich people uh, would just have inherited money and they would invest that money. And the typical interest rate for much of the 18th century was like 10%. So they would live on the 10% interest. Of course, she, um, uh, the risotto on their toshi, the, 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 the return on their investment. So, um, yeah, ordinary people had a very different kind of life. Uh, the lifestyle of the rich was bought really at the price of the poor. And for other people, life was uh, very hard. So let me try and explain this idea of enclosures then. And basically, you've got quite a lot of the countryside that doesn't really belong to anybody at this stage, at the, in the early part of the 18th century. And you get people who've built their houses on this land, this common land, and they're using it to grow food or to graze uh, animals or to hunt animals, basically what we call subsistence farming in order to feed their family. And uh, the enclosure uh, or enclosure uh, with an E in modern spelling, an I in those days, it was the legalized privatization of common land. And obviously uh, that could be done in various kinds of ways. And uh, in, I'll show you how it was done in the 18th century. And this is the way we look, it, if we look at it, uh, roughly speaking, this is the system that was used. You've got a certain amount of private land in, you know, I don't know, one part of England, okay? You've got some people have private land, so that uh, you've got um, Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C, and their family, they have a lot of land. They're important people in that area. So uh, they've got big chunks of land, and then you've got D, C, so, so D, E, F, G, H and I, they've got smaller amounts of land, but they're still doing okay. They've got a reasonable amount of land. And then you've got uh, J, K, L, M, N, O, P and uh, Q, uh, they're, they're, they're friends. Uh, and, and they've all got kind of, you know, a small amount of land, just a little bit. But they, again, they've got something. They're settled. They've got a bit of land. They're secure. They're safe. Then you've got all the other people I was talking about who use the common land. Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. They've all built their houses on common land and they're using it for small scale farming. So, uh, what's going to happen? How are we going to, how are we going to divide up the, 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 the common land? How would you like to do it? I expect if it was you, you think, well, let's give Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z, let's give them a little bit of land, basically, so that they've got something to live on as well. Do you think that's what they did in the 18th century? Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not the way they did it. Here's what they did. They gave A a lot more land. They gave B a lot more land. They gave C a lot more land. They gave D, E, F, G, H, and I a bit more land because they already had some. So they got new land in proportion to what they already had. And uh, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, well, they got a bit too. And what would happen to Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z? Whee! Kick them off the land. Bye-bye. All right? <laughs> so... That's basically the way they did it, all right? Um, so where are they going to go? What's going to happen to them? All right? Uh, they are going to be, most of them, the urban poor. Uh, 
the poor people who are living in the new cities. They get pushed off into the new cities that are growing up. They have to work in the factories, uh, especially as the 17th century, sorry, as the 18th century continues and the Industrial Revolution gets going. They have to live in the factories. So um, they, they have to live in the cities and work in the factories. So they're getting pushed off the land. Now, some of them may have been living on the land for a very long time, um, but they were now denied access to that land. Their families may have been there for hundreds of years, but they were going to be forced off the land by these new laws, and they would have to go and live in the big cities and work in the factories. And the land would be added to the property of the wealthy landowners, making them even richer. In particular, the Enclosure Act of 1773, which was after the Industrial Revolution was uh, getting going and they really needed to get more people, to push more people into the factories and the coal mines, uh, that, that was the big national act. There had been, before, it had been done in a local way. In this area, we're going to do it. In this area, we're going to do it. The 1773 was the first national act where it was happening all over the country and people were being pushed from all areas of the countryside into the cities. And then there would be other people who would be forced off just because they didn't have the necessary paperwork. They might have been living there for hundreds of years. They might, have, they might actually have a right. Okay? They might actually have a right to that land, but because they couldn't read or write, they didn't have any papers. They couldn't prove that it was their land, and so they would also get pushed off. Uh, so some of those people that got pushed off, um, you know, they, they, they actually, uh, in law, uh, should have been allowed to stay, but because they couldn't prove it, or they couldn't pay. Sometimes uh, it wasn't just a matter of we can't read and we can't write, but to get the papers is going to cost you £30. £30 is each and income no curio for those people. Okay, it's only it's only costing for saying yen for us. Okay, but it's it would be a lot of money in those days. So uh, they couldn't pay that money. So again, they would be pushed off the land because they couldn't afford to get the papers to prove that it was their land. And so, as you can see, the rich are getting richer all through the 18th century, and the poor are getting poorer. Even today, about half of Britain is owned by about 40,000 people. Okay? And that's a direct result of these enclosures acts and the system that had grown up over hundreds of years of wealthy landowners. Some people have all the privilege. Some people are born with uh, huge amounts of privilege and other people simply are born with little or nothing. And that, that's, still, that's still the case in Britain today. H about half of the land is owned by uh, Yom Mang Ningurai. Okay? They own half of Britain. So, uh, we'll, we'll often be seeing... A lot of when, when we're talking about the 16th, 17th century, we can't quite often see how it connects with today. But when we look at the 18th century, a lot of the 18th century still influences us today. So something like this, it's still there. The big difference between the privileged people who have the land and those people who don't. Why was it possible to make such unfair laws? Surely the government is fair, isn't it? Oh, no, 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 no. The Seiji Cup are out in the streets of Japan right now. I don't know if you trust them or not. But the basic lesson about politics is that if you trust, if you trust them, you're being naive, frankly. Okay? It's a dirty game. And I'm not saying that everybody in it is dirty, uh, but people who want to keep clean in politics have to be clever as well as idealistic. Um, in those days, mostly we could say that the parliament itself was basically corrupt. It was out for itself. It wasn't there to look after uh, society. It was there to look after its own 
Uchi no kind of group, all right? Uh, it wasn't there for, for the rest of society in general. And an example of that, or the, the, the classic example of that, is what are called the rotten boroughs. Um, most people didn't have the right to vote at all. That didn't come until the 19th century for men and the 20th century for women. And members of parliament were elected uh, by just a small number of people who had got voting rights. Just how people got voting rights is, is, is also it's a little bit kind of pushy, a bit of a mystery, but um, it would be historically this family or this person, they have the right to vote. Okay? And the, uh, of course, they vote by area. Okay, so this area for this politician, this area for this politician, just the same as in Japan. Okay, each area has its uh, politician, and so um, that those areas hadn't been changed. The boroughs, as they or the constituencies, we tend to call them constituencies in modern English, but boroughs they were called in those days. But they hadn't been changed for hundreds of years. But society was changing, so some of those areas had become big towns with thousands of people in them. And others had, you know, the people had moved away and they they were tiny little places and only there's like maybe 50 or 60 people living there. So, um, especially these small ones were known as, uh, very often they were rotten boroughs. They were open to abuse. There might only be a few people who had the right to vote, and they can be bribed, they can be bullied. Uh, they didn't have a secret ballot. On the voting day, the people who could vote would come up, and there'd be somebody standing there with a stick saying, you are going to vote for the right people, aren't you? Because if not, I've got a stick. Okay? Or else they would get them very drunk. Come on in, come on in, yes, have a drink, yeah, have another one, have another. Now just sign here, please. Okay? So there'd be various ways of kind of guaranteeing, really, that, uh, that, that the um, privileged person would get, the, would get voted in. So these were the rotten boroughs. There was no real competition. Um, sometimes there was only even one candidate. There wasn't anybody else uh, voting uh, that, that you could vote for. There was only one person that you could vote for. So uh, the election, uh, the result of the election was clear from the beginning. There's only one person you can vote for. So uh, it was a, a very, very unfair system. And because of that unfair system, the government itself, the parliament itself, uh, was filled with kind of unfair ways of thinking. So exploiting the poor was just normal, I think, for the, for, for the government in those days. So parliament was in the hands of the elite. It was the elite who made the laws, and they made the laws for themselves for their own benefit. Uh, really, uh, in the late 17th century, uh, there'd been something called the Glorious Revolution, and it was the elite who had taken control of the country as a result of the Glorious Revolution in the uh, late 17th century. The king was no longer so important. You remember, I don't know, well, if you know about the 16th century, Henry Hasse, Henry VIII, had total power. He could kill anybody he wanted. He'd just turn around and say, chop, chop the head off, chop the head off. And go, oh, yes, yes, chop the head off. That was the end of them. Okay? They could do that. He could do that. But by the 18th century, the king had relatively little power, and it was the elite that was in control. And they were controlling it for themselves. So... Uh, you could say not much has changed because uh, the rich are still getting richer and the poor are still getting poorer. So, uh, in some ways, again, the 18th century is a sort of shadow of, of today's world. And in order to understand the, um, the Enclosures Act, we need to uh, look at a bigger picture uh, the picture of the agricultural revolution. And the agricultural revolution is connected, as is the industrial revolution, uh, connected with the population of the country. You can see how 
For hundreds of years, the population has slowly been growing. There was a glitch here in the 14th century when uh, there was Pesito plague and half of Europe was killed off. But apart from that, the population was naturally kind of growing slowly. And you can see that it's in our 18th century here that we start the turning point, leading to the, the modern population explosion that, that's uh, still continuing in our lifetime. So the 18th century is important because the population is suddenly starting to grow. It would have been growing even earlier, but there were some nasty diseases in the earlier part of the century uh, that, that killed off, a lot, again, killed off a lot of people and kept the, the growth down. But, but basically, the birth rate was going up and up and up. So we need to see the enclosures inside a bigger picture here, uh, a picture of population explosion and uh, changes in the way that agriculture, nogyo, uh, the way that agriculture works. As I say, the population had been going up for a very long time, and we are down here uh, in the second half of the 18th century reaching a turning point. And as the population starts to get up to like about 10 million, you've got the problem of how the country is going to feed itself. And that problem is getting more and more serious. A lot of people are going hungry. Uh, I don't think the rich particularly cared if the poor were hungry. It's just that if they were too hungry, they would die and then they couldn't work. Uh, so they wanted to keep the poor alive because they needed them to work uh, in, in the factories and so on. So you got your traditional farming methods, which were basically by hand. People would be planting seed by hand. People would be uh, cutting down the, the grain by hand. Uh, and it was very inefficient, not just because it was by hand, but also because these people would, like I say, have only a small area of land for themselves. Uh, the small areas of land, you, you can work by hand. Even like Japan today, you still can see rice fields with people bending down and planting the rice by hand. Uh, but it has, to, and it has to be done by hand. It takes a lot of human labor. And once you start getting machines, which the 18th century is the age of when machines are getting started, you want machines to do big areas. Okay, you want to get rid of all those little, little, little areas. Okay, you want to, you want it, you want it to be big and have a big open field, and the machine can go and put the seeds in the whole area. So again, you got to kick Whee! them out. Okay, ha <laughs> you like that one, don't you? I like that too. Uh, so the old methods weren't working anymore. You had to get new methods to uh, make the food production process more um, efficient. So this may not look like high technology to you now, but in the 18th century, this was a, mecha a mechanized, an early mechanized way of planting seeds. As, as you push it forward, it's got a little hole that opens up and puts a seed every, every sort of six inches or something, whatever it might be. Okay? Um, so it, it spreads the seed out uh, as you push it forward. And of course, later on, they had them pulled by horses and, and, uh, and so on. So, as the machines are being developed to make the farming more efficient, they can grow more food. But at the same time, they need large fields for it. Okay, you can't, can't really imagine a, a horse and a, you know, a machine like this in a, an area the size of this room. Okay, it needs to be a, a big area to work properly. Okay, then, then it's worth it. So this is another reason behind the enclosures, to get the, la to, 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 to get the land into big blocks so it can be farmed in this more efficient kind of way. And those big blocks all belong to the same rich people. So on the one hand, these new farming methods pushed a lot of people off the land, but firstly because uh, if it's 
done by machines, you don't need so many people, and secondly, because uh, the land is being made into big blocks by enclosures and people are losing their small plots of land. But at the same time as pushing people off the land, it makes it possible to feed the growing population more efficiently. So I suppose, I don't know really what you say, it's the world changes, everything changes. And the old methods of uh, farming and the old style of living, subsistence farming, where people grew enough for their own family, that way of life had to come to an end. Society was moving forwards. So this is a, a threshing machine. Uh, again, you, people would collect large amounts of corn and they, it would go into there and it would separate the, 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 the corn, the actual seed, from, the, from the, 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 the grass part so that it could be taken off and then made into bread. And of course, steam power is coming in. By the end of the 18th century, you've got steam power being used in agriculture as well so that uh, it's powering things like... Um, it, it, they used, I mean, one of the earliest forms of mechanization for agriculture was the windmill, you know, to, to grind the flour, the uh, komugiko, to, to make the mugi um, into komugiko, and um, so you could make it into bread. But um, that was done by wind. You've seen those windmills in the countryside, perhaps. Uh, maybe you've just got an image of the windmill. I don't know. Um, using steam would be much more reliable. It doesn't depend on the weather. Okay? Uh, it, it will work under all circumstances. And steam, of course, is going to change the, uh, the whole way that the, the, the society uh, works. What really got the Industrial Revolution going technically was the, technologically, was steam, the use of steam. The idea that you could uh, boil water and uh, use the pressure created by the boiled water to drive machinery. And people had known that steam generates energy uh, since the time of the ancient Greeks. They'd known about it, but they, they, they just saw it as a bit of fun. Look, isn't that funny? You can make... I mean, Hero in, the, in ancient Greek times had a little machine, little kind of machine. He could make things go around by, by setting the steam to push it. Uh, but everybody thought, oh, what should I need? But they didn't actually think of doing anything with it until the 18th century. And that's when they started to say, we can, we can use this energy. So uh, the, the actual way in which science and technology were moving forward obviously played a huge part in, in changing the world at this stage. From about uh, the middle of the 18th century, the 1760s or so, you've got steam power becoming more and more prevalent, more and more used in production of goods, so that you're moving away from the cottage industries again. In agriculture, things were being done by hand, and those basically those same people who would uh, grow food by hand uh, in the evenings, they would sit in their cottages and they would make their own clothes. All right, they would make, uh, and there would be somebody in the village who made shoes. All right, everything was being done by hand. People would just go out and do it. They, they would do it. It's called cottage industry. Things were produced by hand. Uh, as, as more and more people moved into the cities and you got people doing jobs that were not productive in that way, like being a teacher or a lawyer or a, you know, a banker or something like that, you got uh, small industries growing up so that people would not just be making uh, gloves or socks or something for their own family, they'd be taking them into the city and selling them to other people. So that was called cottage industry, and it was being done basically by hand. People would sit and uh, knit the socks or sew the, the, the clothes, and they would uh, put everything together by hand. But what we're seeing from the middle of the, 17th, sorry, the 18th century onwards is that factories are growing up that can do that more efficiently, more cheaply, and 
uh, again, people are being pushed away from those cottage industries that they used to practice. You actually got one group of people, I haven't uh, put them on the print, but there was a, a group of people called the Luddites who went around smashing up the factories and smashing up the equipment because they, they felt, well, that's taking my work. I've been sitting in my cottage making you know, clothes, or I, I've been making shoes in my village for years, and now they've got factories that can do all of this thing, and it costs half the price. So they went in and smashed up the machinery. They were called Luddites, um, and they, they were sort of reacting against the Industrial Revolution. But of course, the Industrial Revolution needed labor in a different kind of way. It needed people to dig out the coal that was going to be used to burn the fire, to, to light the fires, to fuel the fires that were going to boil the water, that were going to produce the steam, that were going to make the machines work. So you needed laborers of a different kind. And again, this is not very, not, not on the prints, but, ba but basically, Okay, now we are mechanizing production. The markets are also going to change. This is, where, this is where last week's class comes into contact with this week's class. Britain needs the empire because it's got the factories and we're making the goods and we can make thousands of them. We can make millions of them. But who's gonna buy them? Come on, India. You send us the raw cotton, okay, and we'll send you back the cotton shirts, and you don't have to make them at home anymore. We'll make them for you. We'll ship them to you. Come on, America. Okay, come on everywhere, all right? Uh, we will send you our goods. And Britain became what was called the workshop of the world. So it wasn't just inside Britain that cottage industry was being threatened. It was all over the planet, because suddenly there were these mechanized goods. All right, and they're much cheaper, okay? Um, it's a process that goes on and on, all right? Those, those cotton factories uh, were keeping people in work up until the middle of the 20th century, okay? My mother grew up in a cotton town in, in the north of England. Big mills, I still remember them, okay? Uh, big chimneys putting smoke out into the sky and producing cotton and making shirts. In the 1950s, a little group of people came from Japan to, to that little town, and everybody was very polite to them and showed them around. And they were very polite, and they said, thank you very much. Thank you for showing us your factory, and thank you for... <laughs> a year later, again, thousands of, <laughs> of cheap shirts came from Japan into the market, and the, the factories in Britain all had to close. So this kind of process of competition, and now it's, of course, in Japan, it's, it's China that's, that's you know, send, selling, uh, you look at every, anything in, in Japan and it's made in China these days, okay? So every country is having its own industrial revolution and kind of competing with, for the markets, and it's still a process that's still going on, okay? But, Britain was the first, okay, and it was incredibly uh, powerful because there was no real competition there, okay, there wasn't anybody else with big factories who was producing uh, goods in the way that Britain was. So they needed, they needed more and more labourers, but this time not, not for, uh, you know, cottage industry or uh, agriculture, but to produce things that were going to be sold all around the world. So they still needed labor, just for just a different kind of laborer. And uh, this is this is one of the old mills. It looked it actually looks quite pleasant, doesn't it? You know, uh, when you see it now, it doesn't look too terrible. But inside those mills, uh, there would be machines operating twelve hours, fifteen hours a day. Uh, and people would, would work uh, six days a week. Typical working week, 60 to 80 hours. 
and the towns would look like this. In fact, as I say, the, the town my mother grew up in was a, a little bit like that up until the middle of the 20th century. Okay? Perhaps not quite so many chimneys, but, but not so different from that. So the environment was being changed. This would have a big effect. This, the, the, this kind of environment growing up in the 18th century had a big effect on people like Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, Byron. The country that they loved was suddenly becoming blackened with smoke and, and a, a place of monstrous machines. So the, what we call the romantic poetry of the uh, 18th century grew up in reaction, again, against this. So the Luddites were not the only reaction against the uh, Industrial Revolution. Romantic poetry could also be seen as a kind of reaction against the Industrial Revolution. Um, please notice that when we say romantic, we don't mean kind of romantic love. Uh, we mean uh, it's connected with Roma no Jidai no Shizen no Kangai Kata, the way they thought about uh, um, nature in, in classical time. So it, it, later on it came to mean romantic love, but its original meaning was uh, love of nature. Okay, the romantic love was the love of nature, and it, then it moved on to uh, love between people. So um, the romantic poetry was, uh, you know, in praise of nature. Okay. Let's move on. Here you can see the kinds of conditions, the kinds of work that even children would be doing in those days. The working week was around 60 to 80 hours. So we like 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week. And even children, uh, average age for children to work in the, the uh, average age for children to work in the 18th century, uh, average age was 10, I think. From, uh, um, Young, even, but even children of like three years old would, would sometimes be working in factories. Okay. And they would get very little pay. In fact, they would get paid less because they were children. Okay, so they might be working very hard, but because they were children, they would get paid less than an adult. And a woman got paid less than a man, even though they were doing the same work. Uh, so... Conditions were very dangerous, but there were no human rights in the 18th century. Uh, the idea of human rights itself is something that grew up in the late 17th century. Jean King, who you know what, uh, before the 17th century, Jean King did not. You don't have any rights in this world. You're born here, you suffer here, and you die. And if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. But you don't have any rights. The idea of rights is something that grew up in the late 17th century, or over the course of the 17th century, but it didn't really develop very much in the 18th century. Too much war, too much social conflict, too much going on. The 19th century is the time when we'll see uh, rights developing. So that if you got injured, if you, had, if you got killed, uh, it would be just, oh, show the knife. Okay, it wouldn't be like, oh, you lost your hand? In, in an accident in the factory, oh, let us pay you compensation. No, no, no. If you can't work, we'll cut your pay. Okay, if you've only got one hand, you can only do half the work. We'll give you half the pay, or else go. There would be no uh, kind of protection for uh, workers in those days. So the rich 
uh, would be gaining all the profits, and if people couldn't work for injury or something like that, well, that's their problem. And there was no question about who was on top. Okay, basically the ordinary people were totally under the control of the rich in those days. So they were uh, manipulated by the political situation and they had very little control over their own lives. Um, just as a, a point of interest for you, at a personal level, I've talked about my mother and her, her uh, mill town, the cotton mills. My, my, listen it, my great, 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 great grandfather. I think that's right. Seven generations back. Okay. Uh, he worked in a coal mine. Okay. Six days a week. 12 hours a day, from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. So in the winter, he wouldn't see the sunshine, except on Sundays. He would take an apple, a bit of water, and some bread. And that was all he had for 12 hours while he was under the ground. must have been tough, right? I mean, if not, I wouldn't be here, okay? If it had been me, I would have been dead, and I wouldn't be here now, <laughs> okay? If you see what I mean. Uh, I don't think I could have survived working 12 hours a day, six days a week in a coal mine. So that was, that's the reality of, 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 of life. Still, for, you know, we families still remember those things. It's family legend. Uh, uh, about my great, 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 great grandfather, for example. So, life was changing, society was changing, the whole shape of life was changing, and England became the first major country in the world in which the number of people living in cities was greater than the number of people living in the countryside. Of course, there have been like these city-states, uh, you know, even in classical times, you had you had places like you know, in in Greece, they'd have a big city, and the land around the city belonged to the city. But but they did, they did, I'm talking about like real proper countries, okay, that have several cities or a number of cities and towns and villages. And in fact, in the world, it's only in the last few years that the world now has more people living in cities than in the countryside. I think that happened in 2011 or 12 or some five or six years ago. But in Britain, uh, Britain was the first, or England was the first country in which that happened. Okay. Um, so again, Britain was quite an, especially in the 18th century, was quite an extraordinary country, with its uh, worldwide empire, the first the world had ever seen. Uh, it's Industrial Revolution, the first the world had ever seen, and it's new cities. Well, they weren't new, but they were growing hugely. This is London uh, at around about the uh, middle of the 18th century. And by the end of the century, it had a population of more than one million people, which was more than 10% of the population of the country. Okay? Uh, there was a huge number of people uh, of the population had been pushed out of the countryside and into the cities, so London had grown very, very quickly into, uh, well, it was then the biggest city in the world. Um, parts of the city were very stately and elegant, where the, where the rich were living, but uh, other parts of the city were overcrowded, dirty, and, above all, unhygienic. As I say, a lot of people were dying off in the 18th century from diseases, and one of the reasons was because they were being forced into these cities which were having to grow much too quickly. Okay? A city that's had, like, 
20,000 people living in it for a long time, is used to you know, working things out for 20,000 people. Right? I mean, you think about 20,000 people, they all have to, um, they all have to use the toilet. Okay? It all has to go somewhere. What happens when suddenly it's 200,000 people? Ten times as many people. You've got problems. You've got raw sewage flowing into the streets, into the rivers. You've got real dirt. You've got real dirt. Okay? You've got real problems. I mean, they, they were doing their best. They were trying to build up infrastructure. But it, these cities had some very dirty parts to them. And some people were living in very dirty uh, conditions. Okay, the, the, uh, the slums, as they were called, uh, still, they still do call run-down areas slums. It's a little bit like, it's not, yeah. Ghetto usually implies a racial group, but slums is not racial. It's just a, a, a people living in a poor area in the city. It's called a slum. So it's like a ghetto, but without the racial element. Uh, and disease, of course, was rife. You can see this, this is a sort of, ugh, just bursting out of his skin, okay? Everything is sort of horrific and dreadful. The doctor um, uh, sort of trying to, to look after these people, but, but it's a hopeless task. Disease was killing uh, huge numbers of people in the early especially in the early 18th century. Because of these crowded, unhygienic conditions, you had diseases like smallpox, uh, tuberculosis, Kekaku is a sort of famous. Uh, many of the romantic poets actually died of, of uh, tuberculosis. Um, influenza, uh, various kinds of fevers, all of them diseases that people would catch from each other uh, because of unhygienic conditions, basically. And these were major killers, uh, so much so that the number of people being born was very often less than the number of people dying. More people were dying than were being born in, in some part, some, especially in London uh, and, and the big cities. And worst hit of all were children. Can you believe that if you had a child in London in the 18th century, the chances are it was going to die before it was five years old. 74% of them died before they were five years old. Um, you'd be better protected if you were rich. You'd have more chance of survival, but even the rich were affected. Isn't that worrying? Because the conditions generally were, 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 were so dirty and poor. But, um, Children had a particularly difficult time in the 18th century. And disease killed many of them. There, were, there was a, a, one of the huge social problems of the time was orphans, uh, children who had no parents or who, whose parents could not be found or identified, children who'd been abandoned. And uh, these were at particular risk. Um, at the beginning of the 18th century, there, were, there was, I think, no, nowhere at all, really, that would look after them uh, uh, if their parents were not married and they were Ill illegitimate children. There was no one to look after them. If their parents were married, okay, there would be, there would be certain charities, there would be certain bodies that would look after them. But if the parents were not married, uh, being born to parents who were not married in the 18th century was more or less a certain death sentence. Your chances of survival were very small. Uh, there were lots of these abandoned children, uh, and there weren't very many places that were caring for them. And as I say, if the parents were unmarried, then the, the, the dangers of simply dying on the street were uh, very great. Um, the first kind of charity that tried to deal with the problem was something called the Foundling Hospital, 
uh, set up very idealistically by, by people who said, we want to change this. We, 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 feel, we feel terrible about the children, but also not just because they feel about the children, but because the ones who did survive would mostly grow up to be criminals because they were outside society. The only way they could live was by stealing. Okay? So uh, in order not to have a, a, a kind of subculture of um, people who simply grew up to a life of crime, you had to have some way of looking after these children. You had to have some way of protecting them. Because if they were going to survive in those situations, uh, they would grow up Without, if they had no support from the society, they would grow up to hate the society. They would grow up to see the society as its enemy and simply as something to, to steal from and to, 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 to cheat uh, in order to get what you need to survive. So the impulse to look after these children was partly charity, okay, but, but, but partly also a simple practical reality. But if not, they are going to be a danger to, 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 to mainstream society. They're going to want to take what we've got. So uh, these kinds of charities grew up. The first one was the Family Hospital, which actually, although it was difficult to set it up in the first place, once it came into existence, it turned out to be uh, pretty charitable, fashionable. And so uh, quite a lot of, you can see in this picture, quite a lot of elegant people here coming to help the, the, the children and feeling uh, kind of get a nice buzz, feeling that they're helping the, the, the poor little children. It became fashionable. Um, there, there were, it, it was a ter time of terrible cruelty, but it's not true to say that everybody was, was kind of being cruel. There were quite a lot of people who were trying hard to improve conditions, especially, especially women. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at women's position in the 18th century. Uh, there were a lot of people who were philanthropists who were trying to improve society. Again, not all of them with the best motives, all right? Sometimes with, from selfish motives of one kind or another. But there were people who were trying to improve the situation. There were people who, who thought it was a shame to have uh, children dying on the streets and things like this. So um, the, the founding hospital is, is very famous as being the, the first real uh, charity to give support to these children. And it's still there today, and it has a museum uh, that, that kind of teaches us the history of, of these um, children. We'll look at that in a minute a little bit. Um, okay, we'll look at it here, actually. Um, a lot of the children that were taken in uh, would just be abandoned. They'd just be left at the door of the hospital in a basket or something which tells you a lot about the society, especially what, what really tells us a lot about the society is, is this little, can you, see, can you see this? They've still got, the museum still has, I don't know how many hundreds of, of these. It's a little piece cut out of a dress the, the, the back here and the inner lining of the dress. What would that be for? I think this is a really interesting bit of social history. Let's look at the mystery. You see, leaving this little uh, piece of a, a, a pattern dress had a, a special meaning. People, many of them, did not want to abandon their church child. They hoped that things would get better. They hoped they would be able to come and collect their child later on. So the only way they could do that was to cut a little piece out of a dress, and then later on they could take that dress back to the hospital and say, look, you've got the patch that fits with that dress. And that child is my child. The child that has that patch is my child. So they were hoping that things would get better, that they would get more money, that they would be able to feed their little child. They didn't take their child there just because they didn't care. That little patch tells us a very uh, kind of moving story. They hoped 
that they would be able to come and collect their child. And we don't know. We don't know. Uh, the hospital doesn't tell us uh, what happened to the little baby that came to that afterwards. Did, did the parents come back one day? Did somebody come and collect the child? Did he die like many of them did? Well, what happened to him? What kind of life did the little baby have? Okay, uh, we don't know. So, there's something important about the, the, the message of the, the patterned dress, the little patch that they, that they put with the baby. And it's also, of course, connected with education. Those little patches tell us something else. They tell us, of course, that the, the people who, who did it were the same kind of people who got pushed off their houses and, and their land in the enclosures. The people who couldn't read, who couldn't write. Okay, if they could read or write, they would probably have papers to, to, to show who their child was. Um, they would have some other kind of proof. But, but this was all they had. All right? These would be the, the real poor. The, the ones who had been pushed off the land and so on. And so, taking a quick look at the education of people in those days... The fact that all they could do was leave a th few threads of clothing, it shows that, that the, the poor people in those days would not be able to read or write. They would not have paperwork to show that their house belonged to them or to show that this was their child or something like that. So these were the only kinds of things they had. And again... Charity schools were growing over the course of the century. The, the 18th century was a time when more and more of the poor were being given a basic education. Uh, you got the 1780 beginning of the Sunday school movement. The Sunday school movement was trying to provide just a basic education for working class children. Uh, first it was just for boys, and then later on girls uh, were able to, to go as well. But the basic idea is uh, for children who are working in factories, for children who, uh, during the week, could not go to school, and anyway didn't have money to go to school, these kinds of charity schools would provide for them to get some sort of basic education on a, at least on a, a Sunday. Okay, so uh, that that gives you an idea of the life of people like my great 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 grandfather. Um, six days a week working in a coal mine, the seventh day learning how to read and write. Okay, um, life was tough. Life was very tough. Days that were actually holidays, like Christmas or Easter, were very, very special. There were only a few of those in the year. You'd dress up in your best clothes, and uh, you know it, it would be a very special occasion. But most of the time, the people were living these very hard lives. Uh, even on a Sunday, uh, they would be trying to get basic education so they could read and write. Okay. I will come back and talk more about education, and obviously, uh, for the rich, education would be a very different matter. Um, but let's take a look at some of the social problems connected with the cities. We've seen that health was a big problem, health and poverty and dirty conditions, hygiene and so on. Another huge problem was alcohol. Basically, uh, the poor were being kept satisfied with with, like, you know, you, you, you're working 12 hours a day in a factory, you can get roaring drunk at night, okay? Get roaring drunk, and then the next day stagger in and do another day's work. Keep them quiet. And, and of course, there were going to be all those people who had been pushed off the land but, but couldn't find work in the factories. There were people who were unemployed people, homeless people. Uh, and they, of course, many of them would drift into alcoholism. Uh, part of the problem was that the water was so dirty, and one of the ways to, to drink uh, without 
having to suffer the dirty water was to drink alcohol. Um, but, uh, and, and for a long time, beer, beer was used in this way. Beer, because it's like five, to five or six percent, beer actually does help if you drink it. It does give you some liquid refreshment. The alcohol dries it out, but it, 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 because it's relatively weak, and it does clean the water. It pur the alcohol purifies the water. So actually, breakfast in the 17th century, even for children, usually included beer. Okay, and people lived their lives around uh, beer. But but what what really upset things in the 18th century was not beer, but gin. Gin. Gin was fashionable among the rich and the poor, but it was going to be a, a real problem for the poor, for the lower classes. And the gin in those days, I mean, have you ever tried, have you ever tried picking up a gin bottle and throwing it like that? Oh, and it's, it's incredibly strong. Okay? And if, if you drank a bottle of gin, it would kill you. Okay? It would kill an ordinary person. Okay, but these people, they got used to it. Okay, they built up their resistance, they could drink more and more of it. How much did they drink? You would not believe. I mean, I still cannot believe how much they drank. 50 mil sorry, that says no, no, that's a mistake. It says 50, it should be 50 million, 50 million liters. I, I thought I'd change that. 50 million, I think it's changed on the print. Maybe I forgot to change it on the 50 million liters. I converted it. It was 11, 11 million gallons. That's 50 million liters of uh, gin every year. Okay? That's 50 million. Okay? And the population is something like uh, 500,000 people at the time. 50 million gallons of gin. How much gin was each person drinking? I mean, some of it must have got wasted, you know, because they were so drunk they just spilled it around the place. But gin was becoming a huge social problem. It's like you've got a whole society that's kind of addicted to alcohol. All right, you can see that she's shown here such a sweet and kind face passing the drink, but uh, a skull, uh, like a symbol of death. On her sh resting on her shoulder there. She's got a dual identity. She's, ha she's dishing out death. You can see in this corner um, the, the, the mother feeding gin to her, to her baby. Okay? Which, which actually still, you know, even in the 20th century, that was still kind of seen as something that happened in the working class. Um, my Fair Lady. Okay? Um, you know the, the, the famous uh, Caesar, my fair lady, yeah? Um, when Eliza is taken to meet high class people, she's speaking in a very high class accent, but she's saying really geeking things. Gin was like mother's milk to her. Uh, and <laughs> it was. Gin was being used as a kind of mother's milk to, to, to shut children up, to keep them quiet. And not just gin. My, my grandfather, in the early 20th century, was given acting, opium, when he was a baby to keep him quiet. Okay? It didn't become illegal until the 1920s or 30s. Okay? Uh, opium was being used at this time. Uh, again, some of the romantic poets were taking it to, 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 to limit the pain that they were suffering from uh, uh, tuberculosis. Okay? Um, so the alcohol and, to a certain extent, opium and other drugs uh, were, were huge social problems in the 80s. So basically, what have you got? You've got, if you're poor, you, you can be working in a coal mine and factory, or you can be a criminal, or you can just live on the streets uh, where you'll probably die fairly quickly. Was there no place to go? Was there nothing for the poor? Well, the only 
place that existed was something called the workhouse. Doesn't sound very friendly or cheerful, the workhouse, uh, and it wasn't. It was a place where you could get basic food and shelter in return for uh, doing low-level work. So they might send you to work um, in mending the streets, or they might have you sitting all day. Uh, one of the, in, in Oliver Twist, what little Oliver has to do is he, it's called picking oakum. He, oakum. he has to recycle old rope. They used a lot of rope in those days, and, and they, they would recycle the rope, uh, and it would make your fingers blister. Uh, because it was so, uh, you, you're pulling on the rope, all, the old rope all day, you have to untangle it uh, and make a big pile that then gets recycled. Uh, it was called picking oakum. Um, and, and in return for working like that all day and getting blisters on your fingers, you'd get a little bowl of soup and, and somewhere to sleep. Okay, so that was, you wouldn't get paid. If you're in the workhouse, you don't get paid. Okay, you still have to work, um, but at least you don't die on the street. So that was where the very poor could go, all right? Um, that was the only uh, kind of charity that was open and available to them. So I think I've given a pretty horrible picture, but at the same time a fairly true picture of what life would be like if you were a poor person in those days. It was a kind of, yeah, as I say, with the workhouse, it was a kind of charity, but the conditions were pretty horrible. Not, well, some of them might be a bit better than others, but very often the conditions were very harsh. It's really uh, in, the ninth, in, the 20, in the 19th century that, that, that people like Charles Dickens write about the workhouse in, in detail. But it was, um, it had been there since Elizabethan times, since the 16th century. All right, we said a lot of people would turn to a life of crime. Let's just look at what it was like, you know, what, what the society was like when it came to crime. Let's take a, a sheep. What do you think would happen to somebody who stole a sheep? Well, if you stole a sheep, the penalty was death. Here's a lamb. What do you think would happen to somebody who stole a lamb? The penalty was death. So there was an English saying, you might as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. If you're going to steal, don't steal a sheep. Don't steal a lamb. Steal a sheep because the penalty is the same. You might as well, if you're going to do a crime, you might as well do a big one because the penalty for even small crime is death. So, uh, again, this will be a kind of problem. If you're going to be a criminal, you'd be a big criminal. You'd get as much as you can. Because if they catch you, they're going to put you to death. If you, there's no point saying, oh, it's only a little thing. Well, in that case, I'll steal a big thing. Okay, so if people were going to commit a crime, they would, they would commit a big crime. All right? uh, the typical crime in those days was to go out onto the, the, the countryside when people were traveling from one city to another. Suddenly you'd appear with your gun. Give me everything. Give me all your money. Give me everything. And then you'd disappear into the woods. Okay? Uh, and you'd do it a few times, and they'd send soldiers to hunt you down. Um, you can still see little caves or little holes that they dug themselves in the ground to try and hide. Usually in the end, they'd get caught. All right. But uh, if you don't give me everything you've got, I'll shoot you. I'll kill you. Okay? They were called highwaymen, and they made themselves rich by robbing people when they were traveling from one town to another. It was always the most dangerous time when you were traveling, or one of the most dangerous times. But there were other types of thief and, and other types of criminal around. But they all had the problem that uh, if, you, if it was a small crime, the penalty would be the same as if it was for a big crime. So, combate. Okay. Um, 
Other crimes that carried the death penalty were stealing a handkerchief, for example, from someone's pocket. You could be put to death. It was only a handkerchief. Okay? Hey, that's my handkerchief. You die. Okay? A handkerchief. So why would you steal a handkerchief, you know? Uh, shooting a rabbit. Okay? It's shoplifting. These were all uh, punishable by death. And, and this is a time when you've got a lot of people who are very poor and very hungry. Okay, but if you commit even a small crime, you can be put to death. Even children. Uh, they didn't often put children to death, but they did sometimes. Okay, uh, they had a sort of funny idea. Uh, all, all through the uh, 16th, 17th centuries and into the 18th century, prison, prison wasn't really punishment. Prison was where you went to wait for your punishment. So the punishment would be, you know, whipping, beating, hanging, sometimes even burning. Okay? These, these punishments existed. Uh, or or else you would be pardoned and go free. So the, pen the penalty would be either nothing or death. Nothing or death. Okay. Uh, I didn't put it in the print, but uh, another penalty was beginning to grow up in the 18th century, which was send you to uh, one of the colonies as a kind of labor, a sort of slave laborer, working in the colonies, especially later on Australia, but in the, in the, in the early days also America. And so they'd send you to those colonies to work. And you'd work for 10 years or 20 years or sometimes all your life. But usually it had a limit, 10 years, 20 years, and then you were free. Okay? So uh, some of the people, um, the original people of Australia, their descendants are still living there. They, 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 the reason that they're in Australia today is because their great, 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 great grandfather uh, was a criminal and was sent there. Um, oh, well, a criminal, stole a loaf of bread or something like that, okay, in many cases. So, uh, yeah, um, the, the law and, and criminality was a, a kind of curious, uh, it was very different from today. I forgot to put the conclusion in class version, so here it is, just tacked on the end here very quickly. Uh, during the 18th century, Britain developed the first empire on which the sun never set. Uh, that, it had colonies all over the world. Um, and it was also the site of the world's first industrial revolution. At the same time, though, it was an age in which ordinary people were hugely exploited and had very few rights. Life expectancy at the end of the 18th century had gone up from 35 years or so to 40 years. But for most people, those were going to be years of very hard work and very little pay. And it wasn't until the 19th century that conditions really started to improve, that you start to see a sort of social reform movement going on. So that's that for this week.